fruitful academic collaboration with JU. We have come almost towards the end of our program. And the initiative, I don't know how many of you know about it, it was run with this purpose to introduce area studies in our university. So for the first time, we have initiated this program with European Union and an area of research. And we had extremely fascinating uh, presentation by the academicians, ambassadors, and it was uh, possible because of our program chair, Dr. Manasi Sinha, and we as part of organizing team, and we also got a lot of support from students volunteers. So I would like to thank all the participants without whose participation it would not have been possible. Those sitting over here and those joining us online, it has indeed been a very long day with two fascinating presentations by Professor Hirsch Fikman and Professor Gulshan Sarjdeva. I hope all of you had a very enriching experience. Now we have with us our very own faculty members, two very young scholars, Vasim Akbar Baba and Monika Goswami from the departments of sociology and psychology respectively. Before we move ahead with their presentation, I would like to briefly introduce our first speaker, Monica Goswami. Monica Goswami is an assistant professor of psychology from School of Liberal Education, Kalbuz University. <laughs> Representing a paper on European Union's action plan for mental health and well being during COVID 19. Monica joined the School of Liberal Education as a faculty of psychology in April 2022. Before joining the Gothia University, she worked as an academic officer at National Institute of Open Schooling under the Ministry of Education. Her academic background involved a postgraduate degree in applied psychology from the University of Delhi and postgraduate degree providing counseling and guidance from NCERT. Her research interests include psychological stressors, neuropsychology, and mental development. Over to you, ma'am. It will take me some time to open the word file that I had prepared. Meanwhile, no, I want to be sure. I'll take the lecture from here only. I hope I'm audible to everybody. Yes. Okay. So, as Ma'am just mentioned, that I am going to put the paper on regarding <laughs> mental health of COVID 19. I'm not going to do that. Let me change the topic. Right? I'm not going to do that. So, what I have chosen is the psychological perspective of how European Union was founded after World War II. That's what I have chosen. All right, so what we'll be doing is we'll go one by one how World War II actually shaped the foundation of European Union. All right, and then we'll try to put out themes. For example, power will be one such theme which will come out of four. And then we'll be talking about how integration of 27 nations, because when you see 27 nations coming together to form a union, it's so complex. Like, can you imagine if, you know, the 28 or 29 Indian states collaborating with each 29 states. It's so difficult. And we are talking about collaborating 27 nations. How difficult is that? You will think about the complexities that it will be on. If anybody would like to add something to it. What will be the complexities when 27 nations come together? Different culture. Different culture. That's one. Different language. Languages, ethnicity more or so, and what else can be there? Different norms in the society. The cycle norms, yes. See, so more or so, cultural, yeah, maybe so be cultural practices, there's a bit different from the very seven countries. We can have countries, maybe there will be different diverse sections, right? Different communities, following different practices from a long period of time. Now, all of a sudden, it is said that. You know, now you are going to act as a union. So there will be certain part to it where they will have their own personal identity, but still, now the whole world will recognize them as a union. So on a world level platform, their identity is somewhat shifting. There's a change in their identity. 
Soviet Union was founded in the year 1993. We all know that by now. And it was in, it was a result of World War II as such. The more of the literature that I have read till now regarding this context, it says that European integration was the outcome of World War II. But how did World War II happen? What was the reason behind World War II? What led to World War II? Can anybody tell me that? I hope I am thinking it. Sorry, one by one. Yes. The Great Depression led to World War II. Any other? Like by Adolf Hitler on the Eastern Europe. Attacked by Adolf Hitler, all right. Anything else that you want to add? You guys are from political life. You should know more than this, I hope. Okay, so I'll begin. So I'll try, I'll try to take as less time as possible. So basically, World War II was the outcome of an appeasement policy, which was given by Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain of Britain. Now, what was appeasement policy? Did you about that? Chale, appeasement policy hai ki Hitler ko bol diya, aap ko jitna area le hai ya, aap le lo, aap Germany ko expansion karo, koi aap ko nahi hoti. Nobody is going to check your power. You can expand your area as much as you want. The amount of power you're giving to one person. You know, you are saying that nobody is going to have a look what you are going to do. So in 1930, they gave this appeasement policy. Because Neville thought that this is the second war now. Because now World War I was gone. In 1918, around World War I was gone. In 1930s, Germany was becoming again a coercive power. So, this coercive power would diminish the need to pay for appeasement policy. But appeasement policy came to a lot of consequences. Some say, Pelly God, Jo power Pelly be coercive hair, Jo Pelly be sub for dominate Karna Shakti hair. Aap usko hi kor power de re. Ki jao, Jo Karlo. What kind of a politics are we playing right now? If we see it in current context, is it peace politics or is it power politics? And please differentiate if you say it is peace politics. So how it is peace politics? And if it's power politics, then how it is power politics? And which one is better? There are a lot of questions that I have. And I hope I leave you with a lot of questions. I don't want to give any answers. So, in current context, do we have peace politics or power politics? Power. Which one is better? Peace politics or power politics? Peace politics. European Union is a peace politics or power politics. But now, a few days ago, we had a lecture in which we said that even the European Union is now looking to geopolitics. Why? Why is that? Why are we always looking for power? Why the need for power keeps on arising and arising? Why it never satisfies? And to what extent we want this? You know, if you go by the theory of Maslow's needs, like there's a theory of psychology, Maslow's hierarchy. Which we have to physiological needs, say. Where we talk about basic needs, like hunger, thirst, and basic survival. And then comes the second stage, safety. What is basically, is regarding safety. You know, you want your territory to be safe, and you want your existence to be in a safer zone. We are still in that zone only. We are still trying to assure our safety on what basis. There is mass care, there is holocaust, and not just one. British Hamesha was there. He, you know, he jo holocaust hai, jo Germany mein hua. That is very painful. But do we ever go back to history and do we ever see ki Pehle gas chambers kahan pe aaye? Pehla concentration camp kahan pe aaye? Do we ever see that? No, we don't. Because there is a Western supremacy going on. We always forget what they did. Somehow they are always giving us this picture which is very poorly. That they are the best. And whatever they are doing is the best. So how do we break that? 
Just for example, US is always considered as the most advanced country, technologically very, you know, doing well. But then US was the first country to introduce gas chambers to give capital punishment. So they describe their cause as humane. That this is a humane cause. How do you decide that this is a humane cause or not? Killing somebody is never a humane cause. Even if it's under law. You are not the one who will decide their existence. And you are not the one who will decide to seize them. Yes, what happened? All right, so I was talking about appeasement policy and that's how Hitler sort of, is there anything important that you want to talk, you can have the mic. So, appeasement policy, I pull up, do karna hai karo. 1930, Hitler area expansion start kiya. Ab dhire dhire power start chadi hi. Power to usko pehle khal chadi hi hi. Lekin, ab there is no check on him. Usne expansion start kiya. Australia, Austria, by 1938, Poland we launched. 1938 or 1939 around, Poland English. Now, Britain felt that this is so not happening. This person is going to invade each and every country, each and every nation. Now they have realized they have actually unleashed a lot on themselves. If you give him the power, you know, just get any area. No. This lion will tear everything apart. And when British was realized that, that's the point when World War II started. So World War II started in September 1989, right? And that's how World War II started. Now, what I want to basically discuss in this part is there are certain psychological themes that emerge under war psychology. If you see World War II specifically. So, first is World War II by a consequence we work, which was the European Union by integration. So, if you see European Union talks about no borders, flexible movement, very utopian. The idea of having no borders. And you know, flexibility for everybody. It's very utopian to me at least. And World War II gave this, you know, idea, this utopian idea, which actually came into place as well. So I feel that's how World War II is important as well. Because which is, you know, talking about no borders. Otherwise, we are almost always fighting about expanding our boundaries, expanding our borders. Invading countries, invading spaces, bombing others. That's what we talk about in politics right now. Is that what politics is about? Why was politics in the first place, you know, there? Was it to create wars? Or was it for the smooth functioning of the society? Anybody? So is our society functioning smoothly right now or there are a lot of crises happening? Crisis. crisis happening. So it's defeating its purpose somewhat. Would you agree to that? And if you differ, please. Open for anything. So, this was the second part. I'll be just winding up. And then there is the idea of leadership. That what kind of leaders are we having like in the past? We have right now. For example, Neville Shenzhen. What kind of a leader was he? You know, a person who gave people, they were so power, some power is to do with power. What kind of an impression this leader gives you? Anybody else? A person, a leader who says to the other opponent, what kind of a leader is that person? The first place he should be the leader. 
should move with the leader and all right. So this agreement policy is also called as a weak policy. The policy is the weak. Because you are not going to fight for your people. Eventually, after 10 years, you are anyway going to go to war. Just to avoid, you know, one war or maybe the constant battle that is there, you left your people like that. So the idea of leadership, where is Hitler as a leader, if you see, is very evil and is very prominent. And how do you see it? Yeah. You want to say something? You're raising your hands. Anything that comes to your mind when you hear the word Hitler, what kind of leader was he? Autocratic. Autocratic leadership, what do you know? The autocrat is basically full control. You have to flexibility. This is Democrat or Republican. This is autocratic leader. You have to do anything. You have to abide by that and you have to do it. The power of conviction Hitler had. He would slaughter so many people just by one command. Who is here? Who is a leader? Anybody else? So yeah, the idea of leadership is the other thing. And then obedience comes out of this that how Hitler was able to, you know, ask so many people, to kill so many people, to invade so many countries, to disrupt so many lives on one command. How do we become such obedient people? You know, if somebody is some, for example, which we have a order hai, on paper, we just feel that we have to do it, we have to comply. And that compliance later on converts into obedience. Slowly, gradually, conditioning happens. And then you could just obey blindly. That's what happened in similar cases. Because that's what people say that that was an authoritarian regime. And you know, we acted like barbarians because our leader was like that. And we had one choice. But if you see, is it ever that we don't have any other choice? Or is it that we stop looking at the other choice? That would be my time. And I will leave you with that question. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mamda, madam. So, it has been one of the most interesting presentations ever that I have been moderating. The reason being that uh, in the past six weeks, demand a lot of things because the academicians can only perform well whether it's free. Unfortunately, in contemporary times, we are confined by a lot of rules. So I think uh, by taking a detour, you have uh, reaffirmed the fact that it is only when there is intellectual freedom that we can just allow ourselves to think better. Uh, the floor is open for q uh, Would you like to have, have a discussion right now or should we move away with, uh, move ahead with what's what do you have any questions? Okay. Our next speaker is Mr. Vaksin Kagwar Baba. And uh, so we'll be speaking on the topic politics of climate change and whose perspective I hope this title remains same. <laughs> <laughs> Before we start this presentation, here is a short introduction. Apart from teaching sociology in Gargovia University, he is currently pursuing his doctoral degree from Delhi School of Economics, University of Delhi. He joined the Department of Sociology in 2021. His research interest focused on diagnosis in medicine and network approach to care. He has published some of his research work on dedicated law and news portals. Over to you. Okay, hello everyone. Um, 
So I will briefly talk about uh, something related to largely ecology and in particular climate change, right? So first I'm not interested in uh, taking this issue like we must contain global temperatures uh, below 2% rise. And neither I am interested in the literature which says that we must take care of uh, our coming generations and what we call as intergenerational justice. And neither I am interested in dealing with or understanding this issue of historical justice. That something happened with this industrial revolution and we must do something or this and that, right? I'm not interested in that. So in this brief talk, which will most probably spend for 10 minutes or 15 minutes hardly, I'll be talking about something, what I call as surprising things about climate change or ecology. And what is that surprising thing about uh, climate change or ecological crisis is normalizing what's going on as if nothing is happening, right? How we renormalize, how we normalize things. For example, you must have heard about the uh, this uh, aero, what they call as aeroclaps, something like that. Uh, like you, we had the apocalypse, we had the aeroclips. Uh, last time you heard about that, Del Delhi has become now gas chamber, right? And similarly, we have this odd even route and Similarly, we have authority saying to you that please stay on these designated days, stay in those, use masks, right? So we have all these instructions by the authority. First, the authority denies anything is happening. Once they, once they sort of uh, agree that something uh, uh, abnormal is happening, then they will say, okay, we are going to do different, we are going to uh, proceed with certain uh, new uh, doings so that we can uh, re-establish the norm, right? So I'm going to talk about that, how we normalize things in our everyday life, okay? in relation to ecological crisis. So the most important thing about this normalization is that uh, is, is that not to panic first and then to maintain appearance as if there is no trouble and life goes on. And what's our response to that? So in order to cope up with uh, this threat, our collective ideology is mobilizing mechanisms of dissimulation and self-deception, which go up to the direct will to ignorance. So first we dissimulate, then we uh, resort to self-deception and then eventually ignorance, as if nothing is happening, right? So. This is why you will even see this pattern among uh, threatening societies that they will become blinder and uh, I would say, and they won't focus on the crisis, right? And an extraordinary social and psychological change is taking place right in front of our eyes, right? The impossible is becoming possible. Earlier, what used to be impossible now, that's quite possible. The probability has increased now. The gap which makes these paradoxes impossible becoming possible is the one between knowledge and belief. So we have to understand how something which is impossible now we consider as possible. So what is that? The thing is there is this gap between knowledge and belief, right? And we know ecological catastrophe is possible, probable even, yet we don't believe it will really happen. For example, Celebrating uh, the greening of Greenland, uh, uh, they say that new opportunities that the melting of ice uh, offers to Greenlanders. They can already grow vegetables in the open land. Right? Uh, Naomi Klein says that. Look at this, uh, as she has written in her uh, book *Shock Doctrine*. She says that because this global capitalism exploits catastrophes. So the more the catastrophes, the more it will earn out of these catastrophes. For example, even uh, P. Saina says, everybody loves a good drop. So it's good for everyone. Similarly, Naomi Klein says that if you have more catastrophes, it will be good for capitalism to earn, to capitalize those catastrophes, right? 
And what gets lost in this shift, as I told you that we have, we have become more ignorant about what is happening. And then once we even accept, we somehow try to evade. So what is what gets lost in this shift is proper sense of what's going on with all the un, uh, unexpected traps, the catastrophe hikes. For example, one of the unpleasant paradoxes of our predicament is that the very attempts to counteract other ecological threats may contribute to the warming of the poles. So uh, by that, I mean, for example, we say that we need to heal ozone layer, but the ozone hole actually protects poles from catching up with the global warming. So even if we heal that ozone layer, then poles will catch up with the global warming. So that's complete paradox of this ecological concern, right? And even when we profess the readiness to assume our responsibility for ecological catastrophes, this can be a tricky stratagem to avoid the true dimensions of a catastrophe. There is something deceptively reassuring in this readiness to assume the guilt for the threats to our environment. We like to be guilty since if we are guilty, then it all depends on us. We pull the strings of catastrophe, so we can also save ourselves simply by changing our lives. What is really difficult for us to accept is that as individuals, we are reduced to a purely passive role of those who can only sit and watch what our fate will be. To uh, uh, avoid such a situation, we are prone to engage in a frantic obsessive activity. Then we resort to these activities. For example, even if you are outside, you have this dust bin where you will find three compartments. Okay? Something recyclable, recyclable, plastics, and non-biodegradable, uh, right? So we engage in a frantic obsessive activity, recycle old paper, buy organic food, whatever, just so that we can be sure that we are doing something making our contribution. It's like a soccer fan who supports uh, supports his team in front of a TV screen at home, shouting and jumping from his seat in a superstitious belief that this will somehow influence the outcome. It's, it's kind of, uh, I see some analogy between the two. For example, when you are shouting in front of your TV, supporting the team, it's similarly that, okay, once you are sort of compartmentalizing your wastage into something recyclable, you are doing your part. Because behind that, there is this ideology. And now I am going to speak about that. So it is true that typical form of fetish disavowal apropos ecology is, I know very well, but I don't really believe it. This is the first thing that I know everything, but I don't believe in it. And the second one, opposite form of disavowal is, I know very well that I cannot really influence the process which can lead to my ruin. For example, if I don't believe, then ultimately I will be caught up in the gas drop, right? But it's nonetheless too traumatic for me to accept this. So I cannot resist the urge to do something, even if I know it's ultimately meaningless. So for example, is it not the same reason that we buy organic food, and who really believes that, that the half rotten and expensive organic apples are really healthier? The point is that even if they are really healthier, we buy them because by way of buying them, we do not just buy and consume a product, we simultaneously do something meaningful, show our care and global awareness. Project. So we have this strange combination of catastrophism and routine of guilt feeling and indifference. So my major uh, emphasis here is that ecology today is one of the major ideological battlefields with the whole series of strategies to obfuscate the true dimension of ecological threat. First one is simply ignorance. The second one is market will do its uh, magic. The third one is nature will go on its own. Science and technology can uh, save us. And the last fourth one is super ego pressure on personal responsibility instead of large systemic measures. By that, I mean, simply we have to feel that we are guilty because we have done something catastrophic on this earth. Now what's our responsibility? It's similar to, uh, okay, if you visit a doctor, he will say you that everyone is sick these days. So the premise is you are, everyone is sick. In order to become healthy, you have to do something now. 
Similarly, in order to prevent our earth, we must do something because we have done. So this is the ideology behind that. Why? Because then you will avoid what are the large changes that are required at the global level because you are doing your part. Getting my point? So the predominant ecological discourse addresses us. We are a priori guilty and we are indebted to mother nature and under constant pressure of ecological super agency, which addresses us in our individuality. What did you do today to repay your debt to nature? The ideological stakes of such individualization are easily discernible. I get lost in my self-examination instead of raising much more pertinent global questions about my entire industrial civilization. So I won't question that, what's happening at the macro level. I just, I'm more interested in what I'm doing at the individual level. Because that's the super ego pressure, which we have inculcated because of this green capitalism, what Naomi Klein says is green capitalism. So it, it sort of gives you a feeling that you are doing your own. You don't have to care about others, whether they are doing or not, right? So, for example, for Zizek, he says that the ecological problem we face today is basically ideological in nature. And there is no such thing as nature. For him, he says uh, that when we say nature is something permanent, enduring, and uh, we must return to even what Gandhi said, that we must return to something which was traditional, uh, where we don't have a, a sophisticated technology, right? Where we want to strike the traditional balance, earlier balance. Zizek says that when you say that, nature is permanent it will have it uh, it has the carrying capacity basically it's a figment of imagination earth was never permanent it was never uh natural it was always unnatural as in uh he says that uh for example he says that nature is destroying itself all the time uh and then then the question is whether nature will survive or not what we need to do then in that scenario uh, Zizek says that obviously mother nature will survive. We don't have to worry about that. It will survive. Nature will strike some uh, new balance. The only thing is that we have to care about our own survival. How to carry on with the current goings, right? And he says that already a new nature is already emerging where there is less and less uh, place for us humans. The problem is our own survival. And before concluding, I would say that, as Marx said, that we have to be universal beings because we know that this catastrophe has been brought by humans, by human intervention. What's the role? So uh, I would say Timothy Morton's, uh, he says that we must take into account both the hyper objects as well as, as the uh, hypo objects, as in the macro objects as well as the micro objects. For example, the role of cockroaches, the role of rats, right? The role of insects, how they recycle your waste, right? We must duly acknowledge their presence. That's why he says that these cockroaches, rats, they are the comrades, right? So with that, I will say that the regeneration of the earth obviously does not depend upon our smaller and more mindful role, it depends on our gigantic truth, which is the truth beneath all the talk about our finitude and mortality. With that, I will conclude. Thank you. With this presentation, we come towards the end of our two weeks program. Thank you, sir, for giving us an interesting perspective on climate change. The floor is open for question and answer session. Do we have any questions? Thank you. Uh, so, we know that uh, I heard your lecture. Uh, my question is related to the scientific section of the now we are living in a scientific era, which is somehow also a reason or a root cause. We are from this whole 
uh, issue of climate change and uh, so my question is whether the answer of the solution is coming from the scientific area or there is something in it. So obviously we cannot deny that science cannot do anything in this scenario. Obviously they have a role, but the thing is, as I earlier told that there is huge inconsistency within the theoretical paradigm of the science, how to deal with it. And I think the bigger role is, the bigger role for humanity is that we have something, uh, we need something, uh, some change at the macro level rather than at the very micro level, right? And in doing that, we can take help of science and technology, but science and technology only cannot save us. And there are certain other factors which we must take into account. And I think we need a global solidarity in order to counter this catastrophe, ecological crisis, rather than saying, okay, science and technology will do something for us. It can save us. Eventually it won't because it has its own inconsistency, which are inherent to science and technology. I hope that answers your question. Well. Thank you so much. I would request Dr. Masson to conclude this session. Thank you for and thank you, uh, Dr. Manika Goswami and Vasana uh, Prabhava for the wonderful insight on a topic uh, that is really relevant for the students and all of us uh, here. Uh, so, uh, finally, we are coming to an end uh, for uh, I think so, it's been a long day. So uh, thank you so much for bearing with us and all the patients who are wonderful. So now we are just left with tomorrow's session, which is again very significant in nature. Tomorrow is a very important session. So we all expect all of you to be there again in this class. Uh, the timings are different now. We are keeping it from 2 o'clock tomorrow to till 4 o'clock. Okay. So tomorrow morning session is not there. We are just keeping it from 2 to 4. Please gather here before 2 o'clock uh, around 1 or 1 30. Okay, so with that note, thank you so much for coming and uh, listening to those wonderful lectures. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.